Hello, and welcome to Early Access PyCharm. I'm your host, Navio Leslam. Today, we're going to talk to Konstantin Bulenkov, who is going to tell you all about how JetBrains handled the transition to Apple Silicon. So without much further ado, we're going to dive right in. Konstantin, why don't you go ahead and tell them about yourself? So hi, Nafil. I'm a project manager in the JetBrains Intelligy platform. And I'm responsible for the all the front end and back end of our products based on the Intelligy platform. So I joined uh, JetBrains in 2008 and uh, user interface has always been my passion. After some time, I started working on improving Intelligy UI components, creating uh, new fancy widgets and productivity features and so on. And at some point, I figured out that quite often we want to change things in uh, the user interface, for example, that is not possible to do from pure Java, the plain Java. So basically, we needed more control over what, what is going on than plain Java can give us. So in 2014, we released the first experimental version of JetBrains Runtime. So when I first heard this, I was literally gobsmacked because forking the JDK and building your own runtime is a really difficult thing to do. And what we had done here essentially is fork the open JDK. So I wanted to ask Constantine, what was there before and why they needed to do something this drastic? We started about six or seven years ago. Apple deprecated support of their own Apple GVM. And since then, we had really big troubles with font rendering. So we decided to fix it inside the GDK. And after wow. that, yeah, after that, we decided, okay, so we can do more features. And since 2014, yes, we started to provide our own bundled Java runtime. Wow. So I'm guessing having our own JDK, having a fork of our own JDK that is specifically designed for our IDEs really helped when Apple was going full ARM with the M1 chip. What was going through your mind when that happened? Actually, we knew about this movement because that there were lots of rumors. But again, this is a very interesting question depending on who you are. For example, if you're an Apple laptop owner, you can think, okay, the next generation laptop will be faster and will use less battery. It's fine. It's a good movement. But mm -hmm. if you're a developer, the first thing that crosses your mind will be like, oh my God, my program will not work <laughs> on the new <laughs> Apple laptops. And, yeah. as a, and as a developer, you actually, you have reasons uh, to think like this. I remember at the time when this was happening, we were getting so many questions on Twitter and other social media about what our game plan was. I remember there being a really large thread on Hacker News as well. Now, a fundamental change such as this doesn't really occur all that often. So what was so different about moving from an x86 architecture, which Intel uses, to an ARM architecture, which the new M1 chip is based on? In short, there are two major architectures, uh, CISC and RISC. x86 is a CISC architecture. It offers more CPU instructions, many of which execute multiple operations like uh, optimized math and data movement. This leads to better performance, but at the same time, more power consumption decoding these complex instructions. ARM is RISC architecture. ARM CPU instructions are reasonably atomic, with a very close correlation between the number of instructions and micro-ops. The number of, in, of instructions is less than in CISC, only frequently used instructions used. If you have a simple Hello World program written in C++, the transition is quite easy. Just recompile it and that's basically it. The problem is that JVM is not a simple program. It uses many CPU optimizations and uh, OS specific code. For example, 
A big part of the transition was the Java Native Foundation or JNF. Fortunately, Apple helped the GVM community to port JNF to Apple Silicon and shared the source code on GitHub. And when you started working on this, what were, what was your first steps? Because I imagine this is a completely different instruction set. And uh, I know that the JVM had variants that ran on ARM, but what did you need to do in order to facilitate that? First of all, we needed a device to test. So <laughs> that was the, the huge problem to get the Apple device. However, before the Apple announcement, we already experimented with the ARM architecture, for example, on Raspberry Pis. About two years ago, we started uh, our movement to ARM architecture, but two years ago, we just have a build for Linux on ARM. Okay. And about a year ago, we set up a cluster with uh, Raspberry Pis, where mm -hmm. we tested our IDs and our forks of the JetBrains runtime. So you've had experience with this. How did that help you support this new chip? Because it's a system on a chip. It's not just a different architecture. It's There's just one chip and that's it. That's so true. what was the most challenging part of actually doing this transition and how easy was it? The hardest part was JIT compiler. First of all, we don't have enough expertise here. Our main expertise is graphics, not JIT. And uh, if you are a JIT expert looking for a dream job, please drop me a message. So in uh, OpenGDK, there are many optimizations made for specific CPUs. You can simply recompile C++ code to make it work. So we stuck there. At the same time, uh, we knew that other JVM vendors were working on porting OpenGDK to Apple Silicon. And we contacted Azul Systems and started collaborating on making the transition. We met wonderful engineers at Azul who helped us a lot. I'd like to personally thank Anton Kozlov, Vladimir Kempik and others for their help. You guys rock. Wow. Just for context, the JIT compiler is one of the most fundamental to the JVM itself. So that's what actually turns your Java code into instructions for the JVM. So having to work on that, I'm guessing, wasn't easy. Yeah. Wow, that, that's interesting. So you do all of this, you go through all the hard work, you somehow manage to get those special Apple devices that have M1 chip compatibility devices. I think they were shipping with what, A14Z Bionic chips or something like that? Yep. The initial, yeah. So you get all of that, you get all this stuff. Let me ask you the most fundamental question. What is the implication on performance and battery consumption? Do you see things working in a better way or it doesn't really matter? To be honest, I was very skeptical before I received the real M1 laptop. Mm -hmm. So I thought Intel GID or any other, our IDs will perform less productive than on Intel chipset. Yeah. But after some basic tests, I found out that first of all, the power consumption is much, much better on M1 chip. For example, we did a very simple test. We loaded IntelliJ project, uh -huh. uh, the same code base, the same number of plugins, same IntelliJ version, and tried to do a simple operation like re-indexing the project, recompile the project from scratch. And I noticed that these things are much, much faster on M1 chip, about 25 to 30% faster. Wow. And at, the, and at the same time, compared to what? We've compared with uh, MacBook Pro 2018, mm -hmm. something like that. Was it running an i5, i7, i9? It's uh, you didn't have i9 back then. It was Core i7. Oh. So, yeah. 20%, 20 to 25% faster than a Core i7, even from 2018. That's really something, right? Yep. And I was really surprised and I was surprised of the battery consumption because sometimes when you work on uh, MacBook Pro with Intel processors, especially with Intelligy IDEA on a heavy uh -huh. project, sometimes you hear the ventilation fan. And oh, yeah. Sometimes it's uh, very loud. 
at the same time, I never heard a ventilation or something like that on the uh, MacBook Pro with M1 chip. Wow, that's awesome. I'm guessing the effort and the hard work and basically working on the JIT system for JVM was worth it for this. Yeah, that's true. Also, we have some products which are not ported for M1 Apple Silicon mm -hmm. chips, for example, mm -hmm. JetBrains Toolbox. And I was surprised that it works comparably fast using Rosetta 2. Rosetta 2 is a translator. For example, if you didn't translate your program for Apple Silicon chips, mm -hmm. Apple Rosetta 2 tries to do it for you. Yeah. So basically you spend some time on start, on startup mm -hmm. the program, but after that, your program works with a proper instruction set for the M1 wow. processor. And yeah, it was quite a good experience. So my programs I need for the everyday life, they just work. Wow. That's awesome. Thank you, Constantine, for uh, joining us on this podcast. On that note, talk to you soon. Thank you. I feel bye-bye. Just one last thing before we go. We tested the performance of the M1 using the IntelliJ project itself. That's a project that has millions of lines of code on an M1 chip MacBook Pro, as well as a 2018 Core i7 MacBook Pro. And the results were interesting in the sense that the M1 performed much better and basically made less fan noise. The Intel chips were quite good for tasks that took a minute, but for long running tasks like indexing, the M1 did a much better job. And thank you for listening. If you want more of these podcasts, let us know on Twitter.